thanks. Um, thanks so much for the, to the organizers for inviting me and um, letting me come to this awesome workshop. Well, so uh, this group is on thin groups and super approximation. Um, and basically, Apollonian packings connected to the Apollonian group. The Apollonian group is, in some sense, a quint the quintessential thin group. I'll say in what sense later. But let me first introduce what it is. And um, to do that, I'm going to start by saying what an Apollonian circle packing is, for those of you who don't know. So I'm going to talk about unbounded Apollonian circle packings. There's really only one unbounded one. I could talk about integral ones, so we'll stick to the bounded ones. So what you do to construct this is you start with uh, three pairwise tangent circles, one on the outside and like this. Okay, and uh, so what you want to do then is inscribe a circle into each of these little spaces here. So you have these kind of triangular spaces and you want to inscribe circles in here. And is there a unique way to do that? Um, well, that's why these are called Apollonian. Um, it's the theorem of Apollonius that says that to any three pairwise tangent circles or lines, there are exactly two other circles that are tangent to all three. So for example, here we have these three circles and there's exactly just these two that are tangent to all three of them. So there's a unique, so this is due to Apollonius, um, unique way to inscribe the circle here. So, um, and then similarly, there's a unique circle you can inscribe in this space and in that space. There's not an inscribed the way I'm driving, drawing them, but you can keep doing this indefinitely, and what you'll get is a pack of circles, which is called an Apollonian uh, circle packing. Okay, so my interest uh, is going to be in the curvatures of the circles which come up in such a packing. Okay, so say you have curvatures A, B, um, let's see, C, and D here for these four circles um, here. Um, and a really beautiful uh, fact, so by curvatures I just mean one over the radius, a really beautiful fact about Apollonian circle packings is that if these curvatures are in Z integers, then in fact all of the curvatures in the packing um, will be integers. And in fact, you don't have to just, uh, not necessarily just those four uh, circles. If you take any four pairwise tangent circles in the packing and they have integer curvatures, then all of the curvatures are integers. Okay. So here on the um, on the slide, I have two examples of uh, what are called integral Apollonian circle packings. So all the curvatures in these packings are integers. Um, okay, so you'll notice the outside circles have negative curvature. That's basically uh, supposed to indicate that the outside, say, of this circle is in here and the inside is in there. And I'll say uh, another reason why we put a negative sign there in a moment. Um, okay, so these are two uh, integral Apollonian packings. You have the curvatures written inside the circles and then infinitely many such integral Apollonian circle packings. So an infinitely many primitive ones. Okay, by primitive I just mean that the GCD of all the curvatures in the packing is one. So um, infinitely many uh, primitive integral Apollonian circle packings. Um, so of course I could just take any one of these and scale it by any integer and still get an integral packing, but that wouldn't be primitive. Okay, so there's all sorts of questions that you can ask then about these integral packings that are sort of number theoretic in nature. For example, are there infinitely many circles of uh, prime curvature in these packings? Um, and if so, then can you come up with some sort of prime number theorem? How many circles of prime curvature are there less than x? Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, related questions to that. Okay, so how do you determine these curvatures that I've written uh, into those circles in the pictures? Well, uh, so this goes back to a uh, theorem of Descartes from 1653, which says the following, that if A1, A2, A3, and A4 are the curvatures um, of four pairwise tangent circles, 
So for example, um, those circles up there of curvature 2, 3, 2, and 15 on the inside, uh, then they satisfy a quadratic equation, namely, so I'm going to call this Q of A1, A2, A3, A4, uh, which is going to be 2 times uh, the uh, sum of the squares minus the square of the sum of these guys which should be 0. Okay, so um, by the way, if you try plugging in just 1, 2, 2, and 3 into this equation, it won't work. But if you do minus 1, 2, 2, 3, it will. So this theorem, the way it's stated, really just applies for externally tangent um, circles. Um, but you can make it work there by putting the minus sign on the outside. Okay, uh, so how is this, by the way, I'm going to refer to this uh, quaternary quadratic form as the Descartes quadratic form. And this is going to be the Descartes equation. Okay, so how does this help us um, to actually compute these curvatures very quickly? Well, here's, I'm going to uh, do this on this board. So I'm going to draw a nice big Apollonian packing here. So let's say that I um, know the curvatures of four pairwise tangent circles in my packing. Okay, so I'm going to call this, this curvature on the outside is going to be A1, A2, A3, and A4. Okay, uh, so for example, how would I find the curvature of this circle here? So let's do this with different colors. Yeah, I'm going to call this circle the curvature here A4 prime because, so this circle, how is it related to this A4? Well, it is the one other circle that is tangent to the three circles of curvature A1, A2, and A3. Okay. I could actually solve a quadratic equation basically to solve for this A4 prime using this Descartes theorem. Okay, so uh, if I just solve the following equation, so solve Q of A1, A2, A3, and then X, um, which is going to look like this, X squared minus 2 times A1 plus A2 plus A3 um, X, and then plus some things which don't have an X in it, equals to 0. Um, if I solve for x, the two solutions should be a4 and a4 prime. Okay, and the sum of those two, a4 and a4 prime, should be this 2 times a1 plus a2 plus uh, a3. So a4 plus a4 prime is 2 times a1 plus a2 plus a3. Uh, so in other words, a4 prime is going to be uh, equal to this minus a4. Okay? So that's very simple. And similarly, I could, uh, for example, take uh, uh, the one other circle tangent to A1, A2, and A4 besides A3, which would be this circle right here. I'll call it A4. And I could solve a quadratic equation for that circle um, just by uh, uh, fixing A1, A2, and A4 and inserting the x in the third spot. Okay. And then there's also this circle in here, which I'm going to call A1 prime. It's the one other circle tangent to A2, um, A3, and A4. Uh, okay, and so on. And so one way that I can write this down, um, this process down, is I'm going to say V is the vector of curvatures A1, uh, A2, A3, A4. And I'm going to consider the following uh, matrices. So denote by S1, this is going to be the matrix minus 1, 2, 2, 2, 1, 1, 1. S2 is going to be uh, 1, 2, minus 1, 2, 2, 1, 1. S3, 1, 1, 2, 2, minus 1, 2, 1. And S4, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, minus 1. Okay, so if I take S4 times V, that is exactly going to be so uh, a1, a2, a3, and then a4 prime. Okay, so for example, uh, s4 times v is a1, a2, a3, and a4 prime. Okay, if I take like s1 times v, then that's going to keep these three the same, and it's going to switch a1 to this a1 prime, and so on. And so it's um, quite easy to see that actually, if you look at the um, group generated by these matrices, 
uh, its orbit acting on, on uh, V is actually going to give you the set of quadruples of pairwise tangent uh, circles in the packet as far as the curvatures go. So um, I'm going to denote by A the group generated by S1, S2, S3, and S4. This is what's called the Apollonian group. And uh, the observation is then that the set of uh, or or quadruples of curvatures uh, of um, uh, pairwise tangent circles, so quadruple of pairwise tangent circles uh, in this packing. Um, so I'm going to call this packing P of uh, A, B, C, D. It's the packing generated by these, or sorry, I don't have A, B, C, D, A1, A2, A3, A4. So the packing generated by um, these four circles of curvatures, A1, A2, A3, and A4. So this is just going to be the same as as I said, as the orbit of A acting on um, V. Multi multiplication on the left by any of these matrices is just going to be equivalent uh, here in, uh, to, to uh, inscribing a circle in one of these interstices. OK. So uh, let me give you another interpretation of this group, which is a little bit more geometric. This is kind of an algebraic interpretation. Uh, so Take this picture again. So this um, group A is a subgroup of the orthogonal group fixing this Descartes quadratic form Q over Z. Okay. And this Descartes form Q has signature 3, 1. So Q has signature 3, 1. And you can think of this Apollonian group A as a group of isometries of hyperbolic free space. So think of A as isometries of H3. So the full group isometries would be um, OR. Uh, two, uh, three, one. Okay, so uh, right, so so, and I want to basically say in what what uh, to which isometries this this S one, S two, and S three, and S four correspond. And the most natural way to explain that, as far as uh, talking about about Apollonian circle packings goes, is to look at the upper half space model of H three. Okay. So imagine uh, you're looking at the upper half space model where this is the complex plane um, and then upper half space is coming out at you and we've embedded this Apollonian circle packing, these four circles here, into the complex plane. Okay, so what, uh, what you can see actually, what can be shown is that what these, uh, these uh, four transformations correspond to here is the following. So if you look at what's called the dual circles through these original three circles, that means just the circles passing through um, tangency points uh, of any three of these. So here I'll take a, a1, a2, and a4 and look at the circle passing through those tangency points. Okay, and then there'll be one like this, uh, one like that, and like that. Okay, those are the dual circles. They're uh, four pairwise tangent circles. And consider the hemispheres lying those. What these S1, S2, S3, and S4 are doing is they're inversions in these hemispheres. Um, those are the, the isometries that they correspond to. And so what's happening as far as uh, what they're doing to these circles that I've embedded into, into C is, is that, uh, so for example, if I apply S1, um, this inversion through this, um, this hemisphere here, to uh, this quadruple of circles, A1, A2, A3, and A4. Well, A2, A3, and A4 stay put. They stay the same. And A1, well, it remains, after I invert it, the, the image is still tangent to these four circles, but it goes into this little circle here, and it becomes this A1 prime. OK, so that's uh, sort of geometrically what's happening. And if you want to know the fundamental domain of this 
uh, of the uh, action on hyperbolic three space is just going to be the intersection of the exteriors of the, the hemispheres over these dual circles. Okay, so that is the fundamental domain. Um, and it has infinite volume. Okay, so let me uh, maybe now write down uh, some key properties of this Apollonian group A. Uh, so first of all, this group A, so I said uh, the fundamental domain has infinite volume, and its index in OQV is, uh, in fact, in infinite. So it's a small group in that sense. Um, but it's large in an algebraic sense, namely if you look at the Zariski closure of A, it's going to be the full orthogonal group. So the Zariski closure of A um, is just the full orthogonal group. Okay, so this I'm looking at the Zariski closure in ZLNC. And uh, these two things put together tell us that A, this Apollonian group, is a thin group. Okay, um, so. Um, well, yeah, 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 so I think, that's true, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in this case, it's not hard to see that. Um, okay, so uh, maybe, I mean, uh, I think I was supposed to be uh, aiming this talk at graduate students, so I know uh, all the experts in the audience know, but maybe I'll, I'll write, down, uh, write down the definition of a thin group, since this is a uh, um, conference on thin groups. So, uh, I'm going to talk, since we're looking at a subgroup of uh, GL4Z, I'm just going to stick to subgroups of GLNZ. So if you have a subgroup gamma of GLNZ, um, and let's say G is the Zariski closure of gamma in uh, GLNC, then we say that gamma is thin if uh, the uh, index of gamma in G intersect GLNZ is infinite. Okay. So from he from here you see this is uh, this is a thin group. Okay. And now um, before so I'd like to tell you about some results uh, about this group. And before I do, um, I just want to say a little bit why why it is I'm giving a talk about the Apollonian group here and why it's considered the quintessential thin group. Um, it's, I think, purely for historical reasons, really. This was, uh, so in the last decade, as Alariza was saying, there's been um, a huge uh, amount of success in proving uh, super, uh, what do we call it, super approximation um, for, uh, in the context of thin groups in particular. And uh, right around the same time that Bergan and Gambert proved this result in 2008, there was also the development of the affine sieve by Bergen, Gambert, and Sarnak. Um, uh, um, in, well, right around the same time, probably around 2008. And the, what this allows you to do is, for example, you could take um, a certain nice thin group, which has super approximation, um, contained in GLNZ, say, and um, and look at its uh, orbit, for example, the Apollonian group. Okay, you look at the Apollonian group in uh, one of these orbits, and you could uh, count the number of points in the orbit which have, say, the first coordinate has at most uh, a bounded number of prime factors. Okay, so that's the sort of thing that the affine sieve allows you to do. Um, it gives you upper uh, and lower bounds on, 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 on this count. 
And the Apollonian group happened to be the first group, um, I'd say the first concrete thin group where this was applied. So um, all this theory. Um, uh, and so I, I think this, this is just because uh, it, it is such a natural group corresponding to this natural construction here. And a lot of results on Apollonian circle packings and the Apollonian group um, are sort of, were sort of the stepping stone to much more general results, um, as I'll say a little bit more about that um, in a moment. So really, it's uh, just a quintessential thin group in the historical sense. It isn't in any way a typical thin group. It's actually a very nice thin group. Most thin groups are not this nice um, or easy to work with. So, but, uh, okay, so let me now tell you about some of the results um, about Apollonian circle packings and this Apollonian group. Okay, so the first uh, result I want to talk about is basically local information about the group. So um, let's say I have some orbit, uh, AV, say the orbit of A actium minus 1, 2, 2, 3, and I want to say something, I want to know what that looks like if I reduce it modulo D, where D is some square free integer. Okay, uh, why do I uh, want to know about that? Well, for example, that is a crucial piece of information if you want to apply the affine theory. Um, to this Apollonian setting, and I think Alarese will talk more about how that's relevant there. Um, okay, so uh, what do you, this theorem basically describes what, what you get if you reduce an Apollonian orbit modulo a square free integer d. Okay, um, so I'm going to let Cp be uh, the solutions in d mod pz the fourth where v is not congruent to zero mod p. This p here is prime. Um, and q of v, this quadratic, Descartes quadratic form, q of v is zero mod p. Okay. So uh, somehow uh, reducing an Apollonian orbit mod p is going to look a lot like this for most primes p. Okay, so I'm gonna define, I'm gonna let curly p be the uh, sum orbit of A acting on some vector W. This is going to correspond to an a, a integral primitive Apollonian circle packing. Okay, so W, for example, can be a quadruple of, of uh, curvatures of pairwise tangent circles in an in a, um, integral primitive Apollonian circle packing. Um, and I'm going to let PD be this, or, uh, this orbit P reduce mod D. Uh, for d greater than 1 square free. Okay, I'll say a little bit about what happens in the non-square free case as well. So first of all, what you can say is that, oh, okay, I'll need two words to write this. So um, I'm going to split off from d um, any, uh, any divisors of 6, so 2 and 3. So I'm going to write d as d1 times d2. where uh, uh, d1 divides 6 and d2 is relatively prime to 6. Okay, so the gist of this is going to be that the only local obstructions in any um, ap primitive Apollonian orbit is, are going to be modulo 6. Divide 6. Uh, divide what? Are you doing only square free d? This is just square free d, yeah. yeah. So I'll say non-square free. Um, okay, so the first thing is that if you look at PD as a canonical projection into PD1 plus PD2, okay, curly, um, and this uh, projection is surjective. So you can split off these, this kind of bad part from the good part. Now as far as, as, far as the good part goes, um, you can further split this into a product. So if you look at the canonical projection of this into the product over p dividing d2, again, this is square free, so um, just the product of distinct primes, um, and then p sub p, 
so p prime here. This is surjective. And um, what is this? This is just simply this CP. OK, um, so that's nice. And then finally, uh, as far as the 6 goes, well, if you want to figure out what your orbit is modulo 6, uh, you're going to just have to figure it out by hand, looking at wh whatever orbit it is you have. Um, but then one nice thing I can add about this is if you look at P6 and its projection into P2 cross P3, this is also surjective. Uh, so you can't split this as a product as well. OK, <clears throat> so the upshot of this, again, as far as local obstructions go, is that for square free D, the only local obs obstructions are modulo 6. Now you can write down a... Uh, an analog of this uh, theorem, so this is in the same paper. Um, for non-square free D, and just in the interest of time and not having to introduce too much more uh, new notation, I won't write out the whole theorem, but the upshot of the results for non-square free D is that the only local obstructions are modulo 24. So for non-square free D, Um, or mod 24. So what this means in practice is, so uh, here you basically just need to know what your orbit is modulo 6, and then you can deduce it modulo any square for d from uh, understanding what the CP is uh, at all the other primes, which you do understand. And here what you would need to do to, to know your orbit is modulo any d is first check what it is mod 24, and then you can figure out what it is uh, modulo any number using, first of all, basically information like this, except uh, the congruence there would be uh, congruent to 0 mod p to the r for various powers um, r. And then, uh, so for example, if I know what my orbit is modulo 8, I can figure it out what it is modulo 16 by just lifting that uh, in a natural way um, up one power. So in that sense, um, you really only need information about modulo 24. Uh, P2, yes, it's just the point, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, based on, partially based on this um, observation, we have the following conjecture, uh, which, so this is the local to global conjecture for Apollonian circle packings. Uh, in the, in the uh, format I'm going to state it in, this is in a paper with Catherine Sandin. Um, it also appears in a slightly different form in uh, a paper by Graham Ligarius, Mallows, Wilkes, and Yen uh, from 2003. I should mention this paper, actually, I should mention it earlier. Uh, this is probably really the first very influential paper on Apollonian circle packings uh, in number theory. Um, these five authors have a whole series of papers on Apollonian circle packings. They have one called Apollonian circle packings number theory, where a lot of the questions that I'm discussing here were first raised about Apollonian packings. Okay, so what this conjecture says is the following. So let uh, P be an integer uh, primitive uh, integer Apollonian circle packing. Um, and let P24, P sub 24, be the set of residues mod 24 of curvature. Um, so, for example, uh, in this minus 1, 2, 2, 3 situation, uh, this P24, so if you look at P24, uh, or the minus 1, 2, 2, 3 packing, uh, what you get is, uh, let's see, uh, 2, you get three, 8 residues, 2, 3, 6, 11, 14, 15, 18, and 23. Okay. 
So then uh, what this conjecture says is that there exists some x depending on the packing such that if uh, you take a larger integer than that, Well, x is greater than xp, and x is in p24, mod 24, then x is a curvature in the packing. Okay, so this statement, what it's saying, is that basically the only thing you need to do to check if an integer is in the packing, or at least a large integer is in the packing, is check what it is mod 24. So let's say if this, is, uh, this conjecture is true for this first packing with maybe x of p being like a million or something like that, um, then you would uh, know that any integer that's bigger than a million and that is 23 mod 24 is definitely a, a, a curvature, the curvature of some circle in that packing. So that's a very strong statement and we don't, uh, this in this form is still open. There is uh, evidence, some evidence to the fact that this seems to be true um, in this paper of mine with um, Catherine Sandin for uh, at least in the context of these two packings that you see here. Okay, so uh, let me though tell you, well, so first of all, let me tell you a consequence of this conjecture. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, so these are not zero mod P, but if you look at Q of V, so the Descartes, uh, uh, that's zero mod P. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. Okay, so uh, one consequence of this conjecture, if it were true, um, so this would imply uh, the following uh, statement that if you look at the uh, number of integers uh, where A is a curvature um, in, uh, well, really any uh, primitive integer in circle packing, uh, you can make a statement like this, but I'm just going to focus on this since I've explicitly written down what PC24 is in that case. So let's say in this packing generated by minus 1, 2, 2, 3, the top one here, um, and A less than X, this is going to be asymptotic to, as X tends to infinity, X over 3. Because there's 8 um, possible res residues, so you get 8 over 24. Um, and uh, in general, you, d you do get such a positive density statement. The total number of uh, integers that occur as curvatures in any given integral Apollonian packing should be a positive fraction of all integers. And so this was proven, uh, um, I proved this together with Bergan. Um, and so let me state this, so let P be an integral Apollonian circle packing. Uh, so then the number of A and Z, where A is a curvature in P, uh, and A less than X is, well, greater than a positive constant times X um, for some fixed positive constant, not just an area. Okay, um, so that is obviously much weaker than this. It's just a small consequence of this uh, theorem. and. How am I doing time? So maybe I'll, I'll uh, remark one thing here. So this, here what you're doing is rather than counting circles of curvatures less than x, you're just counting every integer with multiplicity one. So for two comes up in this packing twice, but I'm only gonna count it once in this count. So what happens if you count with multiplicity, if you actually do count all of the circles um, of curvature less than x, so you would count that curvature two circle twice, that is a theorem uh, of quite a different nature, it's more geometric, this is more arithmetic, due to Kontorovich and O. Um, so that says that the number of uh, circles of curvature less than x in P, this is going to be asymptotic to some constant depending on P times x to the 1.3056. Um, so a couple of remarks, this 1.3056 is the um, Hausdorff dimension of any such Apollonian packing that is an invariant. Um, the, and this theorem is not just true for packings that are integral. 
um, it's true for any bounded Apollonian uh, circle packing. Okay, um, but again, this is really a, a result of quite a different nature, even though they seem uh, very similar. So let me, uh, well, okay, maybe I'll leave that conjecture up there. Let me tell you the theorem that sort of comes closest to proving this uh, conjecture. Uh, and this is due to Vergan and Kontorovich. Oh, uh, what I'm saying, so okay, uh, maybe I didn't make clear what this notation means. I'm saying this is greater than some constant times x, oh, okay. uh, where constant's positive, but it's certainly less than one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's all. That's all. It's just a much weaker statement. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. <coughs> okay, so. Let me uh, say this theorem. So here, I'm going to let uh, E. So again, P in this uh, case is going to be um, a, uh, a primitive integral Apollonian circle packing. So back to the same notation as in this theorem. So I'm going to denote by E P of x. This is going to be the integers which are um, well, which should be uh, curvatures in the packing P just based on their uh, reduction mod 24, but are not. So uh, a, first of all, less than x, um, and a in p24 mod 24, uh, but a uh, not, uh, not a curvature in p. Okay, so this is the exceptional set. The, these are the integers that violate the local to global principle. So um, what uh, Bergan and Kontorovich shows that there is some epsilon greater than zero such that uh, this EP of X um, is, well, so again, I'm using the same notation, less than some constant, uh, not depending on X, then X to the one minus epsilon. Okay. Uh, so what's it, what it's saying, so this exceptional set, according to this conjecture, should be finite. There's only finally many integers that, that violate this, but this is saying that it's uh, a zero density subset of the integers. So it's not saying finite, but a uh, zero density subset. Um, okay, so this does, uh, this is already enough to show uh, this star here. So you do already get this asymptotic, uh, for example, for this packing of x over three. Okay, so this does imply a star. Okay, and um, I'll say that in this theorem, so I don't have time to go into exactly how, but in this theorem, um, not only does super approximation, uh, depending on how you depend, define that, play a huge role, but uh, maybe mega super approximation. So uh, at least the super approximation you use for sieving uh, says something about uh, um, a spectral gap when you look at uh, reductions mod d where d square free of the group. This relies uh, on a spectral gap for uh, arbitrary d, not just square free. Okay. Um, let me just quickly say uh, a key ingredient in both the proof of this, a, a key observation in both the proof of this theorem and this theorem. And then maybe, uh, oops, I'll finish with a uh, consequence of that. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. I was going to mention that. Yeah, so uh, in this paper of Brigan and Kontorovich, there is an appendix by Vardu, and he's the one that proved this super approximation for arbitrary D in the Apollonian case um, in a very pretty way. Um, again, using properties of the Apollonian group, which are definitely not, um, not there at your disposal for any arbitrary thin group. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, say a uh, key observation that enters into these, both these positive density and this kind of local to global theorem. 
So uh, uh, a very important this is the following observation, important, of Sarnak. Um, this first appears in his letter to uh, Ligarius in 2007 on Apollonian packings. Um, <coughs> so the idea is the following. Um, consider the subgroup. Um, so I'm going to just restrict to the subgroup, which I'm going to call A1 of A, um, which is generated by S2, S3, and S4. So everything but that first generator. You can also consider A2, A3, and A4 and get similar statements. Um, so just throw out the ith generator each time. It turns out that while uh, this Apollonian group is a thin group, um, A1 is no longer a thin group. So it's got a smaller Zariski closure, uh, but it's, it's no longer thin. And you can uh, use that to your, uh, to your advantage. So what are you getting if you're looking at the orbit of A1 um, on acting on some quadruple A0 B, C, D. Well, it's going to be some set which looks like, uh, well, the first coordinate is always A naught because all of these fix the first coordinate. And then the other ones um, are going to vary to satisfy uh, this Descartes equation. So it's not going to be all the solutions. But And what are you getting exactly in the packing as far as what that orbit is? You're going to get all of the circles, all the quadruples, basically, of uh, pairwise tangent circles, which contain the circle of curvature A0 among them. So let me just draw a picture. Here is your circle of curvature A0, uh, maybe curvature uh, B and C and D. You're in this orbit where you're going to be picking up is all of the circles tangent to this. Um, Circle of curvature A0 in the packing. Okay, so if you look at just the integers coming up in this orbit, so coming from the circles tangent to this one, then uh, what you get, so uh, the set A and Z, where A is a curvature um, in this orbit A1, A0, B, C, D, and I can make uh, uh, the same sort of statement for any one of these uh, groups where you throw out the ice generator, um, is going to be just the set of integers represented by the following shifted binary quadratic form. A equals, I'm going to call it F sub A naught XY minus A naught, where XY are relatively prime integers. Uh, and F sub A naught of XY is a positive definite binary quadratic form uh, with the following uh, uh, the following uh, coefficients, so b plus a0 x squared plus uh, b plus a0 uh, plus c minus d xy plus d plus a0 y squared. Okay, so the, um, and the discriminant of this quadratic form is just going to be uh, minus 4 a0 squared. Okay, and the idea is basically to utilize the fact that if you look at the, um, all of the circles in the packing and their curvatures, the integers coming from there, those are going to be integers represented by basically all of these kind of binary forms. That is what is behind, really, in, uh, in a basic sense, behind both of these two theorems. Um, let me just finish by, by remarking some kind of uh, um, consequences, very quick consequences of this observation. One is that. Uh, now that you know that this, these packings contain the, uh, all the integers represented by one, even just one such binary quadratic form shifted by A0, you know that there are infinitely many primes that you get among the curvatures in the packing. Because, uh, well, that's uh, due to Ivani, and you know that there's infinitely many primes uh, represented by this. Um, and uh, furthermore, you know that there's infinitely many pairs of circles of prime curvature, like 3 and 23, um, that are tangent to each other. How do you know that? Well, just take your circle, uh, basically the circle that you're fixing to be a circle of prime curvature, like 3. Look at all the circles tangent to it, and you know among those, there will be infinitely many primes, uh, just again, based on this observation. So you get infinitely many pairs of um, tangent circles, both of prime curvature. Um, uh, the same is not true, say, for triples. Uh, 
always in a triple, at least one of the circles uh, is, is, is uh, even. OK, uh, so uh, let me just, now that we know there's infinitely many primes, let me just put up one more slide, and then I'll be done. Um, OK, so infinitely many primes. So how many circles of prime curvature are there? Um, well, using the super approximation, you can come up with a uh, heuristic for the number of circles of prime curvature in uh, any given packing. So uh, I, let's uh, look at this. So this is in the paper of, uh, together with Catherine Sandin again, uh, from which the local to global conjecture came. So here we're looking at this function, psi p of x. This is uh, the weighted count of circles of prime curvature less than x in a packing p weighted by log p. Okay, um, And so this is uh, related to just the total number of circles of prime curvature less than x uh, in a fairly simple way. And uh, this np of x is going to be the number of circ circles of curvature less than x in p total. So what the heuristic says, and this is not a theorem. It's just a heuristic. It's based in particular uh, on uh, assuming that the Mobius function is random in certain ways. Um, is, uh, this is going to be asymptotic to L2 chi 4, um, so uh, NPx, where this L2 chi 4 is this value of Dirichlet L series at 2 uh, with character chi 4. Uh, here's what the constant looks like. And again, this is a heuristic, so it's not a theorem, but we have some data which uh, is pretty convincing. So here what you're looking at, so this is again looking at this packing generator by minus 1, 2, 2, 3. Um, and this squiggly line is, so unfortunately this was supposed to be colored, but it's not colored. Um, the squiggly line is this psi p of x over n p of x, which we're predicting should be going to L2 chi 4, which is that straight line up there. And you can see it is indeed converging to it quite quickly. OK. Um, all right, so I think I'm out of time. But I'll just quickly mention that this, so this heuristic is not known, but um, upper bounds of this um, order are known for uh, Apollonian circle packings. That is also due to Kunturovich uh, and O. OK, so I'll stop there. <laughs>